following program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of Frankly Speaking. Um, I'm your host, Frank Zaberic, and today I brought back um, a, a former guest of mine from about like a month or two ago, from um, Reverend David, um, David Richardson from the uh, New Hampshire Bible Society. David, how are you doing today? I'm fine, today. thank you for having me back. No problem. Glad to be here. And today we're going to talk about the, the book, a little bit about the book you're, you distribute uh, with the Na um, New Hampshire Bible Society, particularly the Bible, the inner workings of the Bible a little bit. Mm -hmm. And, you know, specifically we want to put you in a hypothetical situation here. We've got an upcoming 4th of July uh, celebration at historic Holman Stadium here in Nashua in a, a week or so. And a lot of, um, like, organizations have, like, display tables around the Holman Stadium parking lot. And I was going to put you like on a, a display table to say New Hampshire Bible Society. Do you have any questions concerning the Bible or something like that? Okay. Or maybe sure. even in your church, because you're also a pastor in your church in Webster. Webster, the little town of Webster, yes, just, just northwest okay. of Columbia. And you're a congregational yeah. minister. Right. So obviously you have people who come up to you and ask off-the-wall questions about the Bible. All the time, and I enjoy every bit of it. I really do. So I'm thrilled to be doing it here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I played baseball as a, in high school at Holman Stadium. I'm, I'm really glad that it's still there, and uh, trust me, my, my, my baseball did not make it historic. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> it was okay. not very good. So moving right along, the number one off-the-wall Pharisee question of all time and how would you respond to this when somebody would ask you, can God create a rock he cannot lift? Yeah, yeah that's kind of um, a, a, a trap question, isn't it? That, that, that is a Pharisee question. And uh, so I love that you put it that way. Because if God can create a rock that God can't lift, then God's not all powerful. And then if God can't create a rock that God can't lift, then God is not all powerful. And so that is really a question from, from maybe... Uh, non-believers or, or people who want to poke holes at religion, to, 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 to poke holes at the, the omniscience and the omnipotence of God. And, um, and so I, I, I don't know that I'd respond other than to say, yeah, that's a good one. You know, thank you, and I'd laugh, and I'd smile, and I'd, I'd shake their hand and say thank you. But, but I, I think the serious part of that goes, um, is God omnipotent, and is God omniscient? Does God have all power, and is God um, all-knowing? And, and, tradition and, and tradition says, yes, God is all-knowing and all-powerful, but, but there are parts in the Bible that, that point to the fact that maybe God is not all-powerful or all-knowing. And, um, and Christians don't always like to go there. But, um, and there are parts of the Bible that contradict itself. So it's a collection of books. It's not one, one book. So uh, I, I would say that once God endowed human beings with free will, the right to make their own choice in their lives, uh, God's omnipotence was diminished. All right? um, and as far as the all-knowing capability, the omniscient part of that, we're actually, it's actually in 1 Samuel where, where we are told by uh, Prophet Samuel that God regretted making Saul the king of Israel. So if God regretted something that God has done, is that proof that God is not maybe as all-knowing as we pretend or we think God is? Um, uh, because we, human beings have free will. Um, and uh, the, the account that I love best about that is, is in uh, the second uh, creation story in Genesis, the story of Adam and Eve. And God sees that Adam's lonely, and he wants to make him a partner and, and a friend, a helper. 
And so he creates all the animals of the field and all the birds of the air, and none of them are helpers, and none of them are partners. And finally, God goes, oh, we'll make him, and they make, and they, in the story, he creates Eve. And now, if God is omniscient and all-knowing, perhaps our atheist friends who asked that question would say, shouldn't he have known Eve was the first choice? And, um, and I would say, well, that's not how the story goes. And we don't get to create the stories. Those are the stories given to us. So um, is God omniscient and all-powerful? Uh, all um, perhaps not. Once, once God created us with free will, like I said, some of that's been diminished. So, uh -huh. you know, and, and I'm not sure that you can be all-powerful if you're not all-knowing. So, and uh, even if you gave him you know, the perfect answer to that question, that doesn't necessarily going to turn their life around 180 degrees no. and become a Christian, a no, staunch I, Christian. Yeah. I think the way you worded the question was, was quite well, uh, um, the great Pharisee question of all time, because they were looking for an answer. They were looking to trap him. Yeah. They were looking to catch him in, in something Amen. that he couldn't do. And he would always turn the question back to them. So uh, I guess that's kind of what I did to you, although not as well as Jesus did. Ah, okay. Yeah. Well, one thing you could probably uh, find people asking that question is in a college philosophy class. Yeah, perhaps, sure. And uh, I guess there was a movie a year or two ago called God's Not Dead. The um, Christian, the main Christian actor was Kevin Sorbo, who played on Hercules. But I don't know, that's like a, ca a cable station that Hercules played on for like, I don't know, five or six it, seasons. It's on MeTV now. Uh, oh, but, okay. Yeah, right before a Very Zena. athletic guy, obviously, if he's Hercules. Yes, and, great, great athlete, yeah. Yeah. And, um, but you have like probably young people in your church, maybe your own kids have come up to you and, and asked you, what do you think of, of um, being a Christian and enrolling in Philosophy 101? With a professor, it seems more often than not are atheist because they get entrenched in their own philosophies and stuff like that, it seems. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just wondering if that's beneficial or even if they didn't take that, because there's a lot of good positive um, attributes to you know taking a philosophy course, like presenting a debate, being good at debate, arguing if you want to become like a lawyer, a salesman, a public relations rep or something like that. Um, it, it's amazing that you're asking this question today because just yesterday in our church, um, uh, you know, we always pray for people who are in need of prayers, but we also pray for joys. And a woman uh, in the church uh, announced that her son, who, who on Christmas Eve will be one of the readers for reading scripture and their lessons and carols, very active in the church and just a wonderful young man. He's in his uh, mid-20s, uh, just got his Ph.D. in philosophy. So, so she, she referred to him as doctor, her son as doctor. So, so you can be Christian and study philosophy. In fact, I think everyone should study philosophy. I really oh, do. okay. Um, I've had quite a few philosophy professors, and, and not one of them tried to, to change who I was, you know, or, or they only tried to help me articulate and understand better uh, who I am in relationship to the world around me. Okay. And, and I think that's important. Uh, you know, we have this big push now in our country, and it's a good one, uh, for STEM, that science, technology, engineering, and math, because we need scientists and we need technology. Amen. We do need that. But I hope we don't do that at the expense of also producing poets and artists and philosophers and thinkers, because we need the liberal arts as well. And, and uh, my fear is that, that, um, that we push one side, we, we don't balance it off with the other. Yeah. And I do believe that no matter what career path someone chooses, uh, a good course in philosophy uh, is helpful because it helps people understand who we are as a people. Exactly. Um, St. Ansel. Uh, in Manchester. In Manchester. The school is named after Anselm, who was a, an outstanding Christian philosopher and theologian. Um, and one of my favorite textbooks in seminary it was um, a systematic theology course textbook. And it was called Faith Seeking Understanding. And so we always need to be searching, I think, in a systematic and a thoughtful way for how, we're, how we understand what we're supposed to believe in. And so I, I uh, uh, you know, I don't really care the opinion that, that college professors try to indoctrinate or brainwash kids, because yeah. I've never had that. I've got uh, a bachelor's degree from Plymouth State. It's now a university, but when I, 
long ago when I was there, it was a college, Plymouth State College. I've got a, a master's degree in business from Plymouth State, and I've got my master's degree in theology from Andover Newton. I never had a professor tell me that I needed to believe in something in a certain way. But they always challenged me to think. And they always asked me to say, why do you think that? And we need to be intentional about what we believe. And, and I found that to be really valuable. Yeah. Um, churches established the universities in Europe. Right? Um, and in this country, Dartmouth and Harvard, founded by the congregational churches. Uh, St. Anselm here in M Manchester, and I'm going to leave some out because you can't name them all, but, yeah. but St. Ans Anselm in Manchester, a, a great school. Um, you've got the Southern Methodists in Texas. So obviously the Methodist church. Baylor is a Baptist church. Uh, so uh, the Wesleyan churches, that, I mean uh, uh, universities. So, uh, I, I think we have to hold on to the tradition that Christianity favors a, a strong and diversified education. Yeah. Right. So that would include a healthy dose of philosophy. Yeah. So I'm a little prejudiced, and I'm not saying that I'm always right, but from my experience, I think that's important. But there's always a balance, isn't there? And while, while it's important for us to debate or, or talk about it, have discussions about what it is we say we believe, you also have to balance that with action. Yeah. Right? So we can't spend all our time in a philosophy class. We have to go out and feed the hungry, clothe the naked, house the homeless as well. And um, uh, so I think it's all about a balance of, of doing the work that God calls us to do and an academic pursuit of understanding what that call really is. So. Yeah. So uh, good question. I, I think a philosophy course is very important. I agree. I agree. Yeah. And also, uh, you know, I hate to say this, you'd like to, your kids, whether they're in the, your church or your own personal biological kids, you'd like to protect them as, as long as you possibly can. But they could work at a job at a manufacturing plant to when, like an atheist who knows scripture, memorizes scripture by heart, sure. and can talk them out of the Bible. Remember, remember your, your, your Bible stories when uh, uh, right after Jesus was baptized, uh, he gets whisked out by the Spirit into the wilderness where he's tempted. And uh, uh, we're told that the, the devil who was tempting Jesus knew scripture. Yeah. And, and, and the devil say, it is written that, and, and, um, uh, and Jesus would counter with something else. So, yeah, you know, scripture can be used um, um, for good and for bad. Uh, you know, uh, the Bible is powerful. And Martin Luther King Jr. always said, power is neutral. Power can be used for good or for bad. And so um, we need to be very, very careful about, about uh. how we use it. Okay, so moving right along, um, I was watching one of the Christian networks the, um, about a month or so ago, uh, Daystar Network, with uh, Joni and uh, Marcus Lamb. I don't know if you're familiar with the... Um, I don't get cable. I don't have a dish. Oh, okay. I, I, I have an antenna that gets public television, and that's it. Okay, anyway, they had a, um, an author on, I guess a Christian author, I think this is like a second or third book, called Ch 21 Seconds to Change Your World. And the guy's name is Mark... Dr. Mark Rutland. And anyway, this book uh, talks about, I guess he's concentrating on focusing mainly on the Lord's Prayer and the 23rd Psalm. Mm -hmm. And basically, he's breaking it down. I guess he went through a period of depression, and he was delivered from his depression by just focusing on the Lord's Prayer and the 23rd Psalm. And I'm not going to focus on every aspect of, of this, these scriptures, except for one, um, forgiveness. Mm -hmm. um, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And I guess one of the things he makes, one of the points he, he shows, is that like forgiving others is sort of like contingent on God forgiving you for your sins. And it's a very, very tough process. It's not easy. It's probably almost like um, quitting smoking or something like that because like I hate to bring him up Donald Trump everybody tends to counter punch every time they feel violated by someone sure, sure. no matter how minute that is mm -hmm. so what's your your full um your thinking of how would you counsel someone who needs to forgive someone who wronged them of boy that, that. that's an unloaded yeah, it, it's not a loaded question. We deal with that all the time. Um, in my denomination, or at least in my church, every Sunday we have a, 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 
communal uh, prayer of confession. So that we say it together. I write it up. And, you know, some people will say, well, that prayer doesn't apply to me. I say, okay, read it anyway. <laughs> you know, yeah. because uh, for two reasons. One is we need to know that we're not the people we're supposed to be. But secondly, we need to know that there is forgiveness offered to us. And we're not only confessing that we're not the people we're supposed to be, we're also confessing that there's a God who forgives us when we are serious in our repentance. That confession, that part of it is, is just as important. Those two parts have to go together. Because, you know, forgiveness without, um, without uh, or repentance without forgiveness, rather, is, is, is torture. And, and uh, forgiveness without repentance is free grace, and it's not free. It costs God greatly. So, so those things do have to go hand in hand. And, and the Lord's Prayer is forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors or our, or, or, um, our trespasses, depending on what version you, yeah. you have. Yeah. And so you have, to, you have to learn to forgive in order to really understand forgiveness, I think, in order to receive it and, and have it healing for you. Because a lot of times the, the person that people can't forgive is themselves. Are themselves. I didn't say that probably, but they can't forgive themselves. Yeah. Um, and so they hold grudges against other people as well. But I, and I wouldn't be too hard on them, depending on what it is. Forgiveness is hard, and and we need to to be easy with each other and be gentle with each other. And, and to say to someone who's just suffered something greatly, "Oh, you got to start forgiving," you say no, and give it some time. Um, you know, not while the trauma is still there. You have to deal with the trauma, not the after effect. And so I, I, would, I would say that it comes in time. And um, there are some things that I, I find um, would be unforgivable if it happened to me. And, and that's, that's the human dilemma, isn't it? Yeah. That, and that's why we need God's grace to help us move along through that. And it also helps to realize, too, that for forgiveness is not necessarily forgetting and oh, forgiveness no. is not necessarily restoration like how right. would you counsel a woman who was battered by her husband or boyfriend yeah you're not going to say well if he says oh i'm sorry honey I'll if you come back to me i'll never hit you again yeah, no that before you before forgiveness is even in, in play there has to be real atonement there has to be real uh, real effort to um to change and to say, and, and so far too often we have people who say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But what I hear is they're sorry they got caught, not that they're sorry they did what they did. Amen. And so, and so yes, forgiveness is there. Um, and, you know, uh, certainly uh, I've, I, I've been a pastor now for 15 years, and I've had, I've had to counsel women to leave um, uh, because of, of verbal and, and physical abuse. And, and, you know, you need to be safe. And, and you need to deal with your, your health and your, um, um, your physical safety. But forgiveness is, is also healthy. Uh, it can be healthy. Uh, it, can yeah. be, it can be uh, um, um, letting go of something that you have no control over. It can be really freeing. And, and, then you, and it's hard to move on to what your life is to transform into if you haven't let go of the prior life. There were some reports that say that, the single vote comparing that with cigarette smoking, that the health effects on one's life that holds a grudge or animosity, bitterness, you know, for like 20 years or so, they could have the same type of high blood pressure sure. and stress anxiety. And well, so some reports even say cancer. I don't know how cancer is tied with, with uh, bitterness and grudges and stuff like that. But if, if you have enough mental stress and sure. it's your sure. adrenaline that's going overtime like constantly. You know, I, I always try to say to, to, to people that, that you shouldn't let your emotions, no matter what they are, control who you are. And, and um, uh, anger and, and a lack of forgiveness can really control who we are. And it's, it's unhealthy. It, it does cause stre great stress. It can lead to other uh, perceived uh, uh, grudges. Um, and uh, it's not healthy. Uh, and, uh, I, you know, I, I recommend to a lot of people that they go to pastoral counselors who are a lot smarter than I am, who, are who have much uh, different training than I have. Um, and it's not, a, uh, it's not a stigma to go to counselors to help you get over stuff because, they, again, they can help you see what you can't, well, that's right in front yeah. of you. And um, so, uh, yeah, forgiveness is healing. 
Uh, and, Amen. And so forgiving someone else is not so much about them. It's about the person who needs to do the forgiving. Amen. And, but it's hard. It and is. It's something we're supposed to strive for, but we, we don't always, always get there. Uh. And um, perhaps the best we can do is just, like I said, let, let it go. You know, because we are, we are human beings, and, and we can't always get to where, where God tells us we should be. Yeah. Uh, but that doesn't mean we're not supposed to try. Two recommendations that were made on the um, cable news network, CNN.com, about this. One of them recommended to watch the news or read the newspaper to sort of substitute more greater um, devastation and stress in other people's lives versus your own. Now, I was divorced. I, I got divorced, and shortly after my divorce was 9-11. Mm -hmm. And when I focused my attention, well, you couldn't help but focus your attention for a month, two months after that event, because that's all that was on TV, the mm -hmm. radio, and newspapers. I found myself doubly depressed yeah. over my, you know, paying child support. My kids were located 50 miles from where I was living. And now I was watching on TV like 24-7 the you know, the planes going into the Twin Towers or people jumping off the Twin Towers because they didn't want to get burnt to death. Yeah. That, you know. That's not my choice of diversion. No. No. I don't mean to make light of it either. That was, I, I couldn't, I'll never forget where I was that day. That, that, that was like the day, you know, where were you when Kennedy was shot? Where were you when the towers fell? Those are, yeah. are etched in our, 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 Amen. our memories. And, uh, but, uh, you know, but the diversion factor. Uh, <laughs> Very short term, they might be helpful, helpful, but uh, I suggest they're not helpful at all. Uh, yeah. Short term or long term, you have to deal with your issues. Amen. You have uh, sooner or later, and sooner is better. One you thing know? CNN also advised as a possible um, relief from this, from uh, from for forgiveness to help forgiveness, is to confront the person who you felt wronged you, mm -hmm. which is good. I'll, I'll say that's, I think there is a biblical scripture that mentions that the first thing you do is confront the person. Yeah, yeah. But I would uh, suggest, too, that if that person has a restraining order against you or is the type of person who calls the police and lawyers all the time on you, pray. In that, the cases like that, pray about it. <laughs> you, you can confront Again, as, as, as a pastor, um, and, and the Bible does say confront the person uh, who is, who is uh, in front of others. Um, but times have changed, and, and you need to be very careful about that. Uh, I, would, I would say confront the issue and how it's affecting you. Right? Um, and confront, the, you know, other people are not supposed to control our emotions. They're not supposed to control our actions. We control our actions. So... I'd say let, let's deal with how, how um, you're reacting to that and, and confront that. If, you, if it's possible to confront somebody, but you don't want to confront a, an abuser uh, in, a, in a dangerous situation. Um, yeah. you know, that's just, just bad advice. Um, so you, but you have to deal with those issues sooner or later. Um, you know, I, I, I've had uh, uh, families where they've lost children, either in car accidents or illness, and... and Everyone wants the mom medicated, you know, or, or um, you know, for that, to, to cover up that momentary numbness as if, as if when the drug wears off, she'll be okay. Uh, at some point, we have to hit bottom. At some point, we have to sit in the mud and yeah. just cry before you can come up. And, and the, diversions, the diversions are just delaying tactics for that. And, and I don't find that helpful at all. Back, if you de if you delay it too much, um, uh, you get sick. It, it it really stops up. So you know I, I always um, uh, want us to cry and laugh as much as possible and and it, and and admit where we are and what's happened. And um, and you know friends will come up and say it's time for you to get on with your life. And and you have to look and say no, there's no way you are going to get on with your life the way it was. How do you transform your life into the next phase? can't do that if you're, if you're being amused or diverted by something else. Certainly, I've never found it helpful to say that person's worse off than I am. That's never been helpful because it doesn't help me address my issues. I need to address my issues. And then if I can get healthy and get, get past it, then I'll go help that person. 
but I don't want to use that with a person as an example of, 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 well, I should get off my pity pot and move on. No, I, I need to deal with what's happened. And, and anything that diverts you away from dealing with that is unhealthy. And I would okay. say it's cowardly, you know, and, and, and that's cruel. Um, but um, that's why we have good counselors and good pastors, and, and, uh, and uh, that's why we have someone we can lean on. Yeah. Okay, moving right along, and I inadvertently, I, I had my notes, but I inadvertently forgot to bring them, but that, that's all right. I, um, but I did talk to you before about 2 Timothy 3, yep. uh, verses 1 through 5. Right. And there's a thing on the internet that says that Paul the Apostle might have been prophesying about a presumed um, uh, Republican candidate. Um, well, he's going to be the Republican candidate. I can't see something happening in the Republican uh, convention. That would be a good diversion. <laughs> I would love that. Yeah. I, I would, my, my undergraduate degree was in uh, uh, public management and political science, so I love this stuff. So that, oh, would, okay. that would be neat. Uh, but, but um, okay, so you, you're familiar with Second Timothy. It's yes. on the Internet that yep. this might be a prophecy by Paul the Apostle on the upcoming events of um, Donald Trump. And it's, it's a pretty nasty five verses. I wish I had them here to read, but I inadvertently forgot them. But, um, okay. You keep talking, I'll have it for you in a second. Oh, okay. But I, I'm just saying that, um, do you believe that this, okay, first of all, Paul the Apostle's not really talking, he's talking to Timothy, one of his, like, disciples here, mm -hmm. that's what the book was written for, that he was um, not really talking about, like, a, a devil-possessed people or the Antichrist, the mm -hmm. quote-unquote Antichrist, but just bad people to just stay away from. Mm-hmm. Would that be the, um, whether or not this is specifically about Donald Trump, would you agree that that passage... There's your, uh, there's your passage, three, if you want to read it, um, out for the folks who are watching, but I, I would... S want me to read it? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I had context. That's, well, that's okay. A I can't read without my glasses on, Yeah, too. so... It, it's a, you must understand this, that in the last days, distressing times will come, for people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, Inhuman, implacable, slanderous, profligates, brutes, haters of good, treacherous. Paul goes on and on. Well, yeah. Uh, and I'm gonna uh, uh, probably maybe yeah, upset. Fine. I'm gonna upset some people by saying this that it probably wasn't written by Paul. Um, oh. He, he gets the tradition says it was, but the, the letter was written long after he was dead, probably by one of his students. But th that doesn't make it any less important. It's in here. Yeah. We confuse Bible prophecy sometimes with predicting the future because that's what prophecy means. Okay. Bible prophecy was not about predicting the future. Bible prophecy was saying, if you don't change your behavior now, this is going to happen to you. And it was all about the now. Okay. Not the future. Um, but over centuries, we, we've, you know, prophesying has, yeah. has become um, predicting, you know, Nostradamus and this stuff. Yeah. Biblical prophets were concerned about their present day. If you don't change your behavior, this is going to happen to you. It's sort yeah. of like a parent saying, stop. You know, you, you drive your car like that, you're going to get into an accident. They're not predicting the accident. They're worried about your driving today. Okay, so um, it was written at a time when the church had, was far more established than when Paul was living. And they had this hierarchy. All right? And um, so the author was probably a, a, a disciple or student of Paul's. Um, it, it was speaking or writing to the church leadership, and he was telling the church leadership how to behave, how to conduct themselves. Uh, so I would say it's probably not talking about Mr. Trump or Mrs. Clinton. I want to be on both sides of that issue. Or even uh, Adolf Hitler. Anybody. Oh, yeah, sure. okay, yeah. But he was talking about people in his day and age, and that tells you that people like that exist in all times and all places, and the human, the, the human uh, condition hasn't changed all that much since this was written. It's just our toys have gotten more expensive and our ways of destroying each other have gotten easier. And, and so we do need to listen to this. This is still valid. Amen. All right. Um, so th like I said, the people that he described have lived in every age and, and they will live in the future. Um, it's the haves and the have nots. And, and you asked, uh, you know, they're not possessed by demons. I, I like the, uh, the letter of James's response to that. So I'm, I'm glad you really brought that up. Uh, James, whose tradition says is Jesus' brother. All right. The letter of James says, For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself tempts no one, 
but one is tempted by one's own desire, being lured and enticed by one's own desire. So I think the Christian faith has enough scapegoats. <laughs> we have the one. We don't need another one. So I, anytime we're talking about someone like, like Paul or, or Paul's student wrote about here, um, we're talking about someone whose own self-desire and someone's own ego and own need for fulfillment is, is taking over. And I, I would never blame that on, on, on a thir like a devil or a demon or something okay. like that. So um, I would say this, though, that, um, uh, we, like I said, we don't need another scapegoat. And, and uh, I think you also asked if, if evangelicals should take a pass on, 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 on the soul. You know, yeah. I, I'll leave that to them. Um, we're not electing a saint in this election. Amen. We're not electing a perfect man or woman. Yeah, obviously, uh, never yeah. have, never will. Uh, Lincoln had his troubles. FDR was not a perfect man. We're electing two hu uh, a human being, and uh, so we should vote on the issues. And we should let our faith uh, inform our decision, but we vote on the issues. So you know, representing the Bible Society, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of pass on that. I'm not going to say, right? Okay, one I, thing. I, I okay, would, let's say anybody. I'll, I'll yeah. throw this out, anybody. I won't blame uh, Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump. But if a person publicly says, I've never asked God for forgiveness because I've done nothing wrong. I've done nothing to ask for forgiveness for. Could a person like that be born again? Boy, um... I, I, I'm going to say yes, believe it or not, because I don't think we determine, you and I, who was born again. Um, that phrase, you know where that phrase comes from. It comes from uh, Gospel According to John. And in John chapter 3, we're told that um, we must be born again. And the Greek word um, is anoten. I'm not sure I pronounced that right, but anoten. And it means born again and born from above. And John's gospel loves, and it's the only place in the Bible, that's it, that, that's it. It's one verse, one little sentence. And, and it means born anew and born from above. And John's gospel loves words that have double meanings. It's it, throughout the gospel. It, it, it's not puns, it's not funny, but it's, it's to make us think. Uh, the author, John, chose that very, very carefully. And um, so... Uh, being born again does not mean it's a one-time litmus test, does it? Does, okay, does born again, saved, and eternal salvation, are they all the same thing? Yeah, I would, well, I would, I would say, oh boy, <laughs> yes, I would say so. But I, I think that other people might have different definitions to those terms. I, I uh, you know, uh, eternal salvation, you know, when people say, are you born again, are they saying, are you saved? as if you have to do something to be saved. That's a pretty functional atheism, atheist question because who does the saving? I, I play a lot of golf, and a lot of my golf buddies will walk up to me and say, have you saved any souls today? And I go, it's not my job. God's job. Yes, God, yeah. Jesus' job. You just plant the seed. Yeah, and exactly. So when someone says, are you saved, the question is, well, that's up to God. That's not, you know, do I believe in God? Yes. Does that make me saved? I don't know. That's up to God. Um, so the born again part, we, we treat that like it's a litmus test. Are you born again? Yes. Well, then you're in. Well, maybe not because you have to accept it every single day. You have to answer that question to yourself every single day. And we don't get to decide that. That's God's work. I tend to believe that, that, that in um, we'll talk about this later, because so and thank you for the questions ahead of time. But, okay. Uh, but um, my my personal belief is God wants all of creation to be saved. Salvation is available Amen. for all of creation. So if parts of creation don't make the cut, that means God has not gotten what God wants at some point. I belong I I belong to I, a church. Earlier years, years ago, my first church actually, that believed that um, Romans ten nine and ten was the the ultimate formula to eternal salvation. Mm -hmm. That if thou shalt confess the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God had raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Right. Because the, with the mouth something right. and with the heart something. I used to right. know it well, verbatim. It, it come, do you do you believe uh, have faith that in in uh, Christ on the cross, that Jesus died for us. Uh, 
that Amen. salvation. And so if Christ died on the cross for us, and that's why Protestants, he's no longer on the cross. He's, he's risen. That's salvation for us. The entry fee, I believe, is just say, yes, I believe. So we, all of a sudden after that, we start piling on. Well, I've got to do this. I've got to do that. I've got to, no, no, no. The bar is pretty low. You've got to believe. Once you believe, there are expectations. How we behave and how we act and how we treat each other. But does that mean we don't get in? I think that's up to God. That's, we don't get to decide that. And I really cringe when I hear people say, well, that person's saved and that person's not. I go, we don't know that. That's, that's not our call. Ah. And that's, that's the judgment that we're told to watch out for. Judgment is not yours and mine. Judgment is God's. And we're, okay. and, and we're told in a number of places that God um, assigns that judgment uh, to Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus, Jesus Christ. And so that part of the Trinity, that's the judgment. And so... I'd rather than ask the question, are you saved or are you born again? I'd rather say, boy, let's pray, pray for everybody, <laughs> you know, and, and, and thank the Holy Spirit for moving us to some point. Ah. You know? Okay, so we might get uh, to that subject a little bit later. Sure. Moving right along, do you believe churches today, both Catholic and, and Protestant churches, have um, kind of um, alienated single and divorced people? It just seems to me that churches are family-oriented entities for the most part, and they kind of shy away from... I mean, when I first came to New Hampshire in, in 2002, there was one Catholic church and one Church of Christ that had, like, um, sing, um, not singles, but um, divorced, mm -hmm. separated and divorced support groups. And now, to my knowledge, there's none of it in the Nashua area. And one of the um, facilitators, when I was in Massachusetts, he made a great statement saying that a lot of, like, not just Christian and Catholics, but, you know, even agnostic and atheist uh, couples, they kind of shy away, assuming they're happily married, they kind of shy away from, like, uh, divorced people because they're so insecure on what their spouse may think and uh, saying, boy, I might have a bad marriage, too. I better not let this uh, divorced person hang around my house anymore or something like that. Wh what's your feelings and thoughts on that? I, I think every church, no matter how good they are at, at, at um, being open for people, could do better. Okay. Right, could do better. Amen. Right, and, and we, you know, all churches think that they're open. All churches think that they're welcoming. I don't. I don't know of too many churches that say you're not. You're not welcome here. You're not one of us. I think that's a. Okay. You know. So I think they try. I. I. I think that a lot of it uh, comes down to, um, you know, who gets the best friend in the, the divorce decree. It's hard for for couples who are not divorced to, to have couple for you know. It, it, Amen. They it, have it, mutual it, friends. Yeah. You know, it's, it's just this human interaction that, that this relationship that changes. They and, gotta pick sides. Yeah, you gotta pick sides, and and you know, and and you know, you always invite couples over to dinner. So who's the couple for this person? You know, and that, and so, and then after a while, friends move on, their life continues on the way it was, and and the divorced couples' lives have, they don't move on, the way they were. They move on differently, and so, that's all part of that transformation that I was talking about earlier. So, um, so it, it, it's a shame that there aren't support groups for divorced people in the area if there aren't because they need it they need it as well I, I think maybe if it's happen if, if there's so many divorces out there people think it's just everyday stuff that's 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 a shame because it's it's got to be awfully hard on people to, to go through that um, and uh, there still is the stigma of people getting uh, a divorce that that we have to deal with and, and you know um, I, I am not of the belief that that um, uh, that they should not be welcome in church. They need to be welcome in church. They need to go, my goodness, who needs it more than somebody who's dealing with some issues? Amen. Uh, no matter what the issues are. Amen. So, so I, I think churches could always do better. No matter how good we do, no matter how well we do, we could always do better welcoming people in and making them feel that they're part of the wider family. Part of the issue, too, that I have is, is how we define family. The way we defined family 100 years ago is not the way we're defining family today. And, and churches tend to look past at the last hundred years instead of today and the next hundred years. And families, my wife and I don't have kids. 
I still consider us to be a family. Oh, um, okay. You know, family of two. Um, you know, um, yeah. I have I have uh, friends down the street who uh, they're in their um, late later years that they're uh, widow and widower. If they got married, they would lose their 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 uh, former spouse's pensions. Oh boy! So so they they live together. They live together. They're a family, as far as I'm concerned. They express their love publicly, and um, so you know, a long time ago that would have been really frowned upon and not, they wouldn't have been welcomed in a church well I think they belong in a church and so we need to be looking at how we define family um, uh, adopted kids kids who are, are um, in foster care are all part of the church's wider family and um, so we, we certainly can do a better job at that no question about it um, I would I would hope that Nashville if anybody in Nashville watch oh, everybody in Nashville watches your show yeah but, but, <laughs> but I would hope that when someone's watching this they'll say well there's you know, it's got to be a place for, for a support group for people in that situation, and they'll start one. Amen. There, there, there has to be. And, and, you know, the Internet is not the place to do that. Yeah. So that's, that's yeah. As, as, as modern as I try to be, I'm really pretty old-fashioned. The Internet is something I'm not overly. Yeah, you, know. you need the face-to-face. -to -face yeah, sure. Um, Family is contact. together. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Not the Internet. Yeah. Moving right along. Okay, the great rock and roll singer-songwriter Billy Joel once sang in a song. I'd rather laugh with the sinners than cry with the saints. The sinners are much more fun. Only the good die young. Mm -hmm. Is it a perception that there's no laughter or smiling allowed in heaven? And like in, in the Gospels when Jesus' life was recorded and he was with the 12 apostles, did he, is there any records that he ever laughed or smiled? I know it's not, he wasn't doing a comedy skit while he was here on earth, but it just seems that being a Christian means you're going to be pious and gloom, uh, you know, have a gloomy look yeah. on your face. And yeah, yeah the, 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 the mendicants who, who hit, the, yeah, whip themselves as they, as they process through the, through the, the abbey. That, that, that's, that's a, um, uh, uh, that is a perception. Um, it is unfortunate that they never recorded, as far as I know, and I've, I've read it, I've studied it, I teach it, uh, I, I still look for a place where it says Jesus laughed or Jesus smiled. or um, He did turn water into wine, so there's something to be said that he might have been a little bit of a party, but he didn't want to do that. His mother made him. <laughs> you know. Oh, okay. So, so um, uh, there are uh, verses where he and the, uh, the apostles and the disciples are, are walking towards Jerusalem and singing hymns psalms and some of the psalms are joyous and they're praise they're praising of, of god uh, he does speak of joy so he does speak of happiness uh, but there isn't a line a specific line that says he laughed or he you know made someone happy or uh, uh, there is a lot of, of of humor in the old testament that's lost to history because of of our um you know humor changes over time in the yeah. translation the book of jonah was originally ancient satire, and and that's lost on us because it's it's just not funny to us because we don't get it. But um, so there is some humor in the Bible. In in, in Exodus, the um, um, uh, the the Pharaoh um, when uh, during, when uh, Moses was in Aaron, were deal they were dealing with the Pharaoh and the Pharaoh's hard heartedness. Well, that was originally supposed to be um, 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 a lampooning him and and like a. a it wasn't a funny time, but, but they were making fun of him. That yeah. got lost. Certainly, when Yul Brynner played him in, in the uh, Ten Commandments, that was, that was totally lost. But, so there is some humor there. Instead of quoting Billy Joel, I'd rather quote my favorite rock and roller, uh, Pete Seeger. Oh, I'm not too familiar with his songs. Well, Pete Seeger. Uh, Alice's Restaurant? No, no, that's Arlo Guthrie. Oh. Pete Seeger wrote, <laughs> um, uh, To Everything There's a Season. He took it from the book of Ecclesiastes. There's a time to weep and a time to laugh. Oh, and the birds made that the The birds, you betcha. Bird. Yeah, okay. Good for you. Yeah, Pete Seeger wrote that. And um, a time to mourn and a time to dance. So there is a time for that. That's from the book of Ecclesiastes, and that's the wisdom literature. So, um, And um, Jesus did say he came to fulfill the law and the prophets. So he would have been speaking about the wisdom literature that was there as well. So uh, you can pretty... You don't have to be a very good lawyer to make the case that it's okay to laugh and have a good time. If we don't laugh on Sunday mornings in my church, I'm, I'm not doing my job. Because at some point, it, 
life can be so bad that you really just have to laugh at it. Amen. And you have to cry. Um, crying is, we talked about um, forgiveness being healthy. Crying has been medically proven to be healthy. Laughing is healthy. And I think those are gifts of creation. Um, and uh, we need to do both far more. We need to cry more because it's Yankee ethic. Uh, men aren't supposed to cry or people aren't supposed to cry. No, you know, get rid of the toxins and cry them out and laugh. Laugh Amen. as much as you can. Amen. Yep. Okay, moving right along. Um, about a, a month or so ago, I had a couple of Pentecostal pa uh, pastors here talking about the subject of uh, speaking in tongues. And they were both, they're biological brothers. One was the pastor, the other was the assistant to the pastor. And I threw out a, um, a, a scripture here that I also forgot with the uh, Timothy scripture, John 14, 12. But the crux of that um, one verse, 14, John 14, 12, was Jesus saying that these works that I have done and greater works than these, ye who believe in me shall do. Right. That's kind of a loose paraphrase but that's what he's saying so um and they basically they couldn't um they wouldn't say these pastors wouldn't say that that verse is talking about jesus prophesying on speaking in tongues because he never jesus never spoke in tongues while he was on no, earth. that's another thing that we're not told that that uh, the bible doesn't say that 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 he spoke in tongues you're right i'm agreeing with you okay it doesn't say he laughed it doesn't say he he uh you know, it doesn't say he spoke in tongues as well. So we still do, is, is, is what the greater works are that we're supposed to have available to us, we're capable of us having, that's not blasphemy to say that, if Jesus himself no, said sure. that, sure. we should have done that. So how, would you, so how do you interpret 14.12 on the greater works that we can do than Jesus? Well, I, I, again, you need to put it in its context, and Jesus is getting ready to leave his apostles and his disciples. Okay. He had more than the 12. He had hundreds, if not thousands, of people following him as disciples, students. And he was getting ready to leave them. And um, he needed to, to build them up. He needed to, to prepare them for their ministry when he was gone. And you don't do that by, by denigrating them and putting them down. So part of that, Jesus loved to speak in hyperbole. He, I, I, Par parables. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, not parables, but hyperbole is like like... You know, before you worry about the speck in his eye, take the log out of your eye. You know, so exaggeration. Uh, but he did say that, that with the help of the Holy Spirit, we would be capable of doing greater things. And the way I would interpret it, and, um, um, <clears throat> you know, this is me, you know, um, he fed 5,000 people in a city. We can feed the world if we chose to. He healed people. You know, there are healing stories throughout the gospel. We could heal every illness if we put our mind to it. We can't heal them. We can't do it today, but we are healing millions of people. Um, look at the hospitals in this area that are that are funded or started by the churches. Uh, you know, St. Joe's. You got the Catholic Medical Center. Um, uh, you have Presbyterian hospitals throughout the country. Seventh Day Adventists. Uh, uh, who was the guy that ran for president that we were just talking? Um, um, the African American, uh, the oh, doctor, Ben Carson. Ben Carson. He was a, he was a neurosurgeon uh, at a Seventh Day Adventist hospital, funded by church. So you know, in Jesus' day, he's he's dealing in smaller numbers and smaller amounts. We have the capability to do far greater things. That's not putting Jesus down. That's not de denigrating anything he did. Yeah. It's saying that the, the possibilities for us are, are endless if we have faith and we do it. Um, we just don't. Some people do. We do the best we can. But so, as, a, as a society and as a world, we don't. To, to think that children die of starvation, I, I think we're like a thousand kids a week on this planet die a week, every week of starvation. That's a sin. You know, um, that, that, that's sinful. Um, and that people die of curable illnesses, that's, that's sinful, really. Um, we could do far greater things than he did there. Um, so that's not putting him down at all. Yeah. That's, we're very capable of doing very great things here. Um, and um, um, the fact that we don't is something we have to answer to, uh, I think. Okay. So moving right along, the last time you were here about a month or so ago, you had mentioned, in fact, you, you said it a couple times, that you, th you feel that um, poor people, needy people deserve nice things. Good things, yeah. Something to that yeah. effect. Yeah. 
Not, so, not junk. Not junk. Yeah. Okay, so I, I was uh, uh, contemplating that statement for whatever reason, knowing that you'd be on here today. And a, a couple things I want to bounce off you. Um, several years ago, I want to um, donate a sofa to either, um, well, s actually, Salvation Army and Goodwill Industries mm -hmm. and the St. Vincent de Paul Society all have the exact same thing, that if you have a slight tear in your sofa or recliner, or like a coffee stain, they will not accept it. Mm. They only want furniture that's like in mint condition. And when, when I was talking to the truck driver, I said, you know, beggars can't be choosy. I mean, you know, I'd like to have nice mint condition furniture in my apartment. So, you know, why don't these needy people mm. go out and get a job and earn the money to pay for these, you know, nice... Um, Castro convertible recliners and sofas or whatever. So do you have any thought? Maybe it's just, you know, my, my um, little qualm against, you know, Salvation Army or Goodwill for being kind of ingrateful. Well, I, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm not going to get between you. This is Counseling 101. I'm okay. not going to get between you and the Salvation Army on that triangle. But okay. I will say this. I'm very glad that organizations like that have standards. Now, what those standards are, we can debate. Okay. Okay. I, I don't know what your couch looked like, but I'm glad that they do have standards for, for people that they serve. All right. All right. That doesn't mean that there aren't people out there that could use, could have used that couch. Amen. All right. And, or a church could have used that couch, and maybe a youth group room, where, where you know, give it to the kids that horse around on at a youth group meeting because it's already got a nick or something. Um, so there are other avenues and sources to get rid of that, or that's the wrong phrase, but to donate that to somebody who could use it. Organizations that have, um, that, that, uh, that are out there and, and their sole purpose is to do that, they have to have some standards. And I'm not going to argue with them or what those standards are because I'm not doing that work. Um, and I, don't, I didn't see your couch, so I don't okay. know. All right, but, okay. so, but, so, but I am happy that they have standards. Because I do think that, that to say that poor people can, can use my word, not yours, junk, um, is an insult in, in, in denigrating those people and saying they're not as worthy as other people. I understand what you're saying, too. Um, you know, let's train them. Let's teach them. Let's get them jobs so that, that they can go out and afford things on their own. But something has happened at this point where, where they can't do that right now. And, and you have to treat the symptoms as well as the underlying causes. And if you only treat the underlying causes and not the symptom, you're, you're not going to move them along. And if you only treat the symptoms and not the underlying causes, you don't, you're not going to move them along. You have to do both. Okay. So, so I understand what you're saying, and, and I agree with that. I think you have to do both. But, um, you know, to give um, poor kids, having friends. Or, great story about Ted Williams, if I can give you the story. Oh, sure. Ted Williams was being scouted. Um, uh, uh, by a, a scout for the Red Sox, and, and he went to his home in San Diego. And the scout wrote back, um, excellent, and this is not a direct quote, excellent ball player, uh, but um, no manners, um, not a nice kid at all. Uh, I'm not sure I recommend him. And the truth of the story was the scout came into the house, Ted Williams sat on the couch and wouldn't get up because there was a hole in the couch, and he didn't want the scout to see the hole. He didn't want to embarrass his mom. And he sat there through the whole thing, didn't get, get up and shake the guy's head. So he, you know, and look at the ball player who turned out to be. Oh, wow. But, but there's a, uh, um, a guy who not only was a great ball player, but a real mover and shaker in, in New England for, for civil rights. Um, and, um, and uh, you know, he just was so embarrassed about the couch that, that it, it could have cost him his career. Yeah. You know? uh, and uh, so why would we? You know, do that to other folks. So I'm not saying that, that, that I agree with their decision because I don't know your situation. But I am glad they have standards for, for people like that because they, there's enough great stuff being tossed to the dump that good stuff can go to for people who can use it. And, um, um, and, um, and self-esteem is huge. If they only deserve junk, then, they're self then, then what are we telling them? Yeah. You know? And we waste so much. We had a church supper the other night, and um, a, a young kid is a great kid. My neighbor was working at the supper. He's in, 
He's in elementary school. And he saw all the food that was being left over. He said, we have to find a place for this. And, and it's good food. We need to give people. And, and I, we had to assure him that there was always a place for the food to go. But we can't continue to throw good stuff away. Um, and, and people deserve to be treated with dignity and respect. Okay, um, we have about two and a half minutes left. Real quick, panhandlers. Yes. You must have some in the Concord oh, area like we, we do. do in Nashua. Sure. Of course we do. So let's say, for example, you, you give a, um, a panhandler like a $20 bill, $10 bill, because he looks kind of downtrodden and mm -hmm. stuff like that, down in the dumps, and you see on the local TV... Uh, and uh, granted, this is the exception. It's not really the norm. Most right. of them are probably very needy people. Right. But the, the panhandler happens to, um, they, the, the media is saying he grosses uh, in the neighborhood of like 60, 70 grand a year, all tax, tax free. free. <laughs> and he drives home at night in a Mercedes Benz that's like two years old. Yeah. Would you feel like you've been ripped off? Oh, of course. Sure. I'd feel like I, I, I may be misjudged or, or um, would not stop me from giving money to another panhandler. Different panhandler. If I, you know, I, I would still continue to do that because I feel the need for me to share what I have. I might do it in different ways. I might make sure that, that the panhandler is, 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 is who that person says he or she is. There, there are plenty of other charities and other ways to get that money to where it's needed. So, um, but um, it's not about that person, it's, it's about me. Do I sound like Donald Trump now? It's about me. My need to give, my need to share, my need to take the good stuff that I, the, the, the gifts that God has given me, I'm blessed. I am thoroughly blessed. And, and so why shouldn't I be sharing that with some people? So I might do it in a different way, but I would still, I would still find someone to give money to. One of my ministers suggested if you go to a place that has a, a, a frequent um, thing that you know Panhandle is always hang out, buy like about a dozen boxes of those breakfast bars, granola bars, mm -hmm. and hand them a box of those breakfast bars sure. instead of giving him money. Sure. That way you know he's going to get like nutrition and he's not going to use the money necessary sure. to buy drugs or alcohol or... Sure. You know, I... I uh My MBA speaks to me a lot. So okay. there are people on Wall Street who cheat, but we still buy stocks. There Amen. are Bernie Madoff, you know, um, built billions. So this guy steals 20 bucks from me, and I'm supposed to lose my temper. No, I, I think that, you know, Bernie, the guys in the three-piece suits can rob us blind and get away with it. And um, uh, I might pat the guy in the back and say, well, you got 20 bucks for me this time. Good for you, pal. Ne not again. And, and, and laugh about it and, and continue to treat the poor with dignity and respect. Amen. Right. Amen. So that's a good ending. I've just been told by my producers we're just about out of time here. That's the fastest hour. I can't believe it. Yeah, I that's know. My, yeah. Time flies when you're having fun. I, well, I had one or two more questions. Maybe I'll have a Bible potpourri show in the six months or so when ask you some more questions, but we'll... I'd come back anytime. You just, you just ask and I'll be here. Excellent. So that's it for ten, uh, today, ladies and gentlemen. Please join us uh, next time for another episode of Frankly Speaking. Thank you and may God bless. The preceding program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters.